Well, welcome back to our course in college physics. And so um, as we're finishing up with this last lecture for college physics one, we'll give a little bit of perspective here. And then um, we have covered a couple of major sections. We spent a lot of time talking about mechanics, talked about thermodynamics, and we took a couple lectures talking about vibrations and waves. And we're just going to begin to introduce this next section on electricity and magnetism. And most of that will be in our second course on college physics too. But um, let's go ahead and proceed with giving a, an introduction to electric forces and, and fields. And so you probably have noticed some interesting phenomena when you're around different types of electric fields. And I think as a result of the lecture material, you'll start to get some, some ideas. And here we're seeing an example of that, that just the attraction that you get a static um, accumulation of charge on some type of a rod, it can actually pick things up. And this is a charge rod is brought close to bits of paper and um, there is a, a, a static attraction. Before we get into the, the details of the lecture, let's just do a few reading question reviews and I'll just quickly go over these and you can be thinking about them as you like. So after a glass rod is rubbed against a silk cloth, the, the glass rod has a charge of plus five and the silk cloth has a charge of minus seven. What could the original charges of the glass rods and the silk cloth have been? The answer is zero and minus two. You are given four objects, A, B, C, and D. You discover that A and B repel each other and that C and D repel each other. If B and C attract each other, which of the following are possible charges for A, B, C, and D in that order? And the answer is A is plus, B is plus, C is minus, and D is minus. The test charge of minus Q at point P is used to measure an electric field. The field is found to have a magnitude of two and over C, where when the charge minus Q is removed, the electric field at point P, and we want to figure out what that is, the answer is we'll have a magnitude of two and over C. Point A is close to an electron, point B is further from the electron, points A and B and the electron are along a straight line. Which of the following statements are true? And the answer is that the field is stronger at point A than B and is directed from B to A. Which of the following will change the flux through a Gaussian surface caused by a charge distribution? And the answer is changing the net charge within the, the Gaussian surface. Okay, um, where would we be without electricity? We're quite familiar with that in our modern society. No, no telephones, no television, no computers, no household appliances, no modern medicine, and the list goes on and on and on. Now we can view arrangements of atoms, probe the inner working of the cell, and send spacecraft beyond the limits of the solar system. All of this has become possible in just the last few generations of human life. A blink of the eye compared to the, our history um, let's start our journey of learning about this powerful tool of the modern world. So in this picture, we're seeing an illustration of static electricity. If you try running a plastic comb through your hair, then hold the comb above some bits of paper, you will find that the comb will attract bits of paper and sometimes the paper is actually suspended from the comb. Imagine a force strong enough to defy the gravitational pull of the entire earth. The same effect occurs with other rubbed material, for example, glass and hard rubber. Although simple experiments, uh, another simple experiment you can try is to rub an inflated balloon against wool or across your hair. On a dry day, the, the rubbed balloon will stick to a wall, sometimes for hours. These materials have become electrically charged. The photo shows another example of this. Here, a little girl's hair is electrically charged from rubbing against the plastic chair. You can give your body an electric charge by rubbing your shoes on a wool rug or by sliding across a car seat. Then if you touch another person, you both feel a shock. These experiments work best on a dry day because moisture helps the charge to leak away. 
So here in the picture, we're showing an experiment set up for observing the electric forces between two charged objects. Experiments show that there are two kinds of electric charges, which Benjamin Franklin named positive and negative. The first shows the interaction of the two charges. First, a hard rubber or plastic rod is, is rubbed with fur, then it is suspended by a piece of string. When a glass rod that has been rubbed with silk is brought near the, the rub, rubber rod, the, the rubber rod is attracted towards the, the, the glass rod, as shown in the figure on the left. If two char charged rubber or glass rods are brought near each other, as in the figure on the right, the forces between them is repulsive. We can explain the observation if we assume that the rubber and glass rods have acquired different kinds of excess charge. We use the convection um, suggested by Franklin, where the excess electric charge on the, the glass rod is called positive and that on the rubber rod is called negative. On the basis of observations like this, we can conclude that the, the charges repel one another and unlike charges attract one another. Objects usually contain equal amounts of positive and negative charge. Electrical forces between objects arise when those objects have net negative or positive charges. So in this figure, we, when a glass rod is rubbed with a silk, um, uh, electrons are transferred from the glass to the silk because of the charges are transferred in, in discrete bundles. The charges on the two objects are either plus or minus E, plus or minus 2E, plus or minus 3E, and so on. Nature carry, um, net, nature's carriers of positive charges are protons, which as you may remember are located in the nuclei of the atoms with the neutrons. The, the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 15 meters in radius and is surrounded by a cloud of negatively charged electrons with a radius about 10,000 times larger. An electron has the same magnitude charge as a proton with the opposite sign. With a gram of matter, in a gram of matter, there are approximately 10 to the 23rd positively charged protons and just as many negatively charged electrons, so the, the net charge is zero. The nucleus of an atom isn't free to move around, so protons never move from one material to another. Electrons are much, much lighter than protons and are easier to accelerate, and they, and they occupy the outer region of the atom. For this reason, objects become charged by gaining or losing electrons. Charge transfers easily from one type of material to another. Rubbing the material, two materials increase, increases the area of contact, which makes the transfer process easier. One characteristic of charge is the electric charge is always conserved. Charge isn't created when two neutral objects are rubbed together. The objects become charged because negative charge is transferred from one object to another. One object gains a negative charge while the other loses an equal amount of negative charge and so is left with a negative with a net positive charge. When a glass rod is, is rubbed with silk, as in the figure, electrons are, are transferred from the rod to the silk. And so this means that the glass rod carries a net positive charge, the silk a net negative charge. In the same way, when rubber is rubbed with fur, electrons are transferred from the fur to the rubber. Here we have a picture of Robert Millikan in 1909. Robert Millikan, who lived from 1886 to 1953, discovered that if an object is charged, it charges always a multiple, the fundamental unit of charge E. In modern terms, the charge is said to be quantized, meaning that the charge occurs in discrete chunks that can be divided that can't be divided anymore. An object may have a charge of plus or minus E, plus or minus 2E, plus or minus 3E, and so on, but never a fractional charge. A neutral atom, which is an atom with no net charge, contains as many protons as electrons. The value of E is given here in the equation. So we're seeing a couple of um, things here in the as illustrations. And first is the... Um, Erlen Meyer flask, and next that we're seeing uh, um, spun um, a bunch of copper wire, and uh, and so in conductors, uh, electric charges can move freely if an electric field is present. All other materials are called insulators. Glass and rubber are insulators. 
when these materials are charged by rubbing, only the, the rubbed area becomes charged and the, the, the charge doesn't move to another part of the object. On the other hand, good conductors like aluminum, copper, silver have charges that can easily move over the entire surface of the object. If you hold a copper rod in your bare hand and rub the rod with wool or fur, it won't attract a piece of paper. This might make you think that a, a metal can't be charged, but if you hold the copper rod with an insulator and then rub it with wool or fur, the, um, the, the rod remains charged and attracts the paper. In the first case, the electric charge is produced by rubbing easily moves from the copper through your body and finally to the ground. In the second case, the insulating handle prevents the flow of charge to the ground. So here we're seeing a couple other um, substances, um, silicon and, and germanium, and these are examples of semiconductors. Semiconductors are a third class of material and their electrical properties are somewhere between those of insulators and those of conductors. Silicon and germanium shown in this pho photos are well-known semiconductors that are widely used in the fabrication of a variety of electronic devices. So in this figure, we're showing um, charging a metallic object by a conductor. Let's think of a negatively charged rubber rod, which is brought in contact with an insulating neutral conducting sphere. The, the electric, uh, extra electrons on the rod repel the electrons on the sphere, which create local positive charges on, on the neutral sphere, as shown in the figure on the left. On contrast, some electrons on the rod are able to move onto the sphere, as in the middle figure, neutralizing the positive charges. When the rod is removed, as in the figure on the, the right, the sphere is left with a negative, a net negative charge. The process is called charge, charging by conduction. The object being charged in, in this process, and in, the, in this case, the sphere, is always left with a charge having the same sign as the object doing the charging, and in case, this case, the, the rubber rod. In this figure, we're looking at charging a metallic object by induction. And so first, where we're seeing a, a neutral um, metallic sphere. When an object con conducted, uh, connected to a conducting wire or copper pipe is buried in the earth, we say that it is grounded. We can think of the Earth as an infinite reserve for electrons, in effect, it can accept or supply an unlimited number of electrons. With this idea in mind, we can understand the charging of a conductor by a process known as induction. Let's imagine we have a neutral conducting sphere that is insulated, which means that there is no conducting path to ground as in the figure. Now, in this case, we have a charged rubber rod is placed near the sphere. So if we bring a negatively charged rubber rod close to the sphere, as in this um, figure here, what happens is the, the repulsive force between the electrons in the rod and those in the sphere causes some electrons to move to the side of the sphere farthest away from the rod. The area of the sphere which is closest to the negatively charged rod has an excess of positive charge because many of the electrons move to the other side of the sphere. And then finally, um, we're seeing the, an example where the, the sphere is grounded. So let's imagine we connect a grounding con conductor to a wire to the sphere as in this figure. Now some of the electrons leave the sphere and travel to ground. And so now we have the, the grounded connection is removed. And so we can remove the ground wire as is shown um, here, and the conducting sphere is left with an excess of induced positive charge. And then um, finally, when the rubber rod is removed from the, the vicinity of the sphere, the bottom right, that the induced positive charge remains on the ungrounded sphere. Even though the positive charge atomic nuclei remain fixed, this extra positive charge is uniformly distributed over the surface of the ungrounded sphere because the electrons spread out. The charged rod, rubber rod doesn't lose any of the negative charge because it never comes in contact with the sphere and the sphere is left with a charge opposite to that of the rubber rod. So charging an object by induction requires no contact with the object and in, in, inducing the charge. So 
here we have an example of a charged balloon that is brought near an insulating wall. So we let's see what we can do with insulators. And most um, neutral atoms or molecules, the center of positive charge coincides with the center of negative charge. But if there is a charged object nearby, these centers may separate slight separate slightly, which results in more positive charge on one side of the molecule or the other. This effect is known as polarization. The realignment of charge within individual molecules produces an induced charge on the surface of the insulator, as you can see in the figure. The property explains why a balloon charged through a rubbing with, with um, stick to, to an electrically neutral wall or why the comb you just used on your hair attracts tiny bits of new, neutral paper. So let's look at this question. And so a suspended object A is, is attracted to a neutral wall. It's always attracted to a positively charged object B. Which of the following is true about the object A? And the answer is it has a negative charge. The reason is an object A must have a, a, a net charge because two neutral objects do not attract each other. Since object A is attracted to positively charged object B, the net charge on A must be negative. <clears throat> so let's talk about Coulomb's law. Um, in 1785, Charles Coulomb, who lived from 1736 to 1806, experimentally established the fundamental law of the electric property, the electric force between two st stationary charged particles. And so an electric force has these properties. So first, it is directed along the line joining the two particles and is inversely proportional to the square of the separate separation distance between them. Number two, it is proportional to the product of the magnitude of the charges of the two particles. And number three, it is a, attractive if the charges are of opposite sign and repulses if the charges have the same sign. From these observations, Coulomb proposed the mathematical form for the electric force between two charges shown here, where Q1 and Q2 are charges separated by the distance R1, and Ke is a constant called the, the Coulomb constant. And we're seeing the, the value listed there. So here in the table, it lists the charges and masses of the proton, the, the neutron, and the electron. As you can see, the charge on the proton has a magnitude of E times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 C, which means it would take over um, 1 over E times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the 18 protons to create a total charge of 1 C. 1 Coulomb is a very large amount of charge. In typical electrostatic experiments in which a a rubber or glass rod is charged by friction, there is a net charge on, on the order of a microcoulomb. Only a very small fraction of the total available charge is transferred between the rod and the rubbing material. So in this figure, we have two points uh, char charges uh, separated by a distance r um, exert a force on each other given by Coulomb's law. The force on Q1 is equal to the magnitude and opposite of the direction to, to the force on Q2. When using Coulomb's force law, remember that force is a vector quantity and must be treated accordingly. The figure on the left shows the electric force of repulsion between two positively charged particles. Like other forces, electric forces obey Newton's third law, so that means that the forces F12 and F21 are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Note that the, the notation F12 denotes a force exerted by particle one on particle two, and likewise F21 is a force exerted by particle two on particle one. From Newton's third law, F12 and F21 are always equal regardless of whether Q1 and Q2 have the same magnitude. So here's another question. Object A has a charge of plus two microcoulombs, and object C, B has a charge of plus six microcoulombs. Which statement is true? 
And the answer is choice number two. By New Newton's third law, the two objects will exert forces having equal magnitude but opposite direction on each other. So the Coulomb force is similar to the gravitational force. Both act at a distance without direct contact. Both are inversely proportional to the distance squared where the force directed along a line connecting the two bodies. The mathematical form is the same with the, the masses of M1 and M2 in Newton's law replaced by Q1 and Q2 in Coulomb's law, and with Newton's constant G replaced by Coulomb's constant Ke. There are two important differences. One, electric forces can either can either attractively or repulsively, but gravitational forces are always attractive. The electric force between charged elementary particles is far stronger than the gravi gravitational force between the same particles. So in this figure, we have a, a small object with a positive charge Q placed near an object with a larger positive charge Q um, is, is subject to the electric field E as, as directed as, sh as shown. The magnitude of the electric force is at, at the location of Q0 is defined as the electric force on Q0 divided by the charge Q0. So um, we, we have a, a test charge Q0 placed at P, which will, will cause a rearrangement of charges on the spheres unless Q0 is, is negligible negligibly small compared with the charges on the sphere. Um, a fascinating thing about both of these, uh, both the gravitational electrostatic field is that they are both capable of acting through space and can produce an effect even when there isn't any physical contact between the objects involved. And these are examples of field forces. The most practical way to talk about field forces was de developed by Michael Faraday, who lived from 1791 to 1867. And this approach on electric field is said to exist in the, in the region of space around a, a charged object. The electric field exerted an electric force on, on any other charged object within the field. Note that this is different from the Coulomb's law concept of force exerted at a distance because the force is now exerted by something. The field, that is, is the, the same lo location as a charged object. The figure on the left shows an object with a small positive charge Q placed near a second object with a much larger positive charge Q. The electric field E is at the location of a small test charge Q0. It is defined as the electric force F divided by the test charge. We need for, for this test charge Q0 to be very small, arbitrarily small in fact, so it doesn't cause any significant rearrangement of the charge creating the, the, the electric field E as shown in the figure on the right. Mathematically, the size of the test charge makes no difference. The, the calculations come out of the same regardless. So, here in the finger, we have um, the electric field of A due to the negatively charged sphere is downward towards the negative charge. And um, B on the right, the electric field at P um, due to the positively charged conducting sphere is upward away from the positive charge. When we use a positive test charge, the electric field always has the same direction as the electric force on the test charge. The electric field at point A in the figure on the left is vertical and downward because at that point, a positive test charge would be attracted towards a negatively charged sphere. The figure on the right shows the field due to a positively charged sphere. Once the electric field due to a given arrangement of charges is known at some point, the force on any charge with charge Q placed at, at that point can be calculated. Notice that Q has been replaced by um, Q0 has been placed by Q, which can be any charge, not just a test charge. So in this figure, we have a test charge Q0 at P is a distance R from a point charge Q. And as shown in the figures, the, the direction of E is the direction of the force that acts on a positive test charge Q placed in the field. We say that an electric field exists at a point if a test charge at that point is subject to an electric force. 
So let's consider a point charge Q located at distance R from, from a test charge Q0. According to Coulomb's law, the, the magnitude of the electric force of charge Q on the test charge is given by the equation here. Because the magnitude of the electric field of the position of the test charge is defined as E equals F over Q0, you can see that the magnitude of the electric force due to the charge Q at the position of Q0 can be written as shown here. <clears throat> this equation shows an important property of electric fields that makes them very useful. An electric field at a given point depends only on the charge Q on the object setting up the field and the distance R from that object to be uh, to a specific point in space. As a result, we can say that an electric field exists at point P, whether or not there is a test charge at, at P. So in this figure, we have an electric field midway between two positively charged um, positive point charges. We can use a superposition principle where we calculate the electric field due to a group of, of point charges. We first use our equation for the electric field to calculate the uh, electric field produced by each charge individu individually at a point and then add the electric fields together as vectors. When you are solving problems, be sure to take advantage of any symmetry of the charge distribution. For example, if equal charges are placed at x equals d and x equals minus d, the electric field is zero at the origin by symmetry. In the same way, if the x-axis has a uniform distribution of positive charge, it can be guessed by symmetry that the electric field points um, away from x-axis and is zero and parallel to that axis. Okay, let's have a couple of questions here. A test charge of plus three microcoulombs is at point P, where the electric field due to the, the charges is directed to the right and has a magnitude of four times 10 to the six newtons per coulomb. If the test charge is replaced with a minus three microcoulomb charge, the electric field P at the electric field at P, it, it remains, the answer is it remains the same. The electric field at point P is due to the charges other than the test charge, thus it is unchanged when the test charge is altered. However, the direction of the force this field exerts on the test um, change is, is reversed when the sign of the test charge is changed. So a circular ring of charge of radius B has a total charge Q uniformly distributed around it. Choose the magnitude of the electric field at the center of the ring. And the answer is zero. And the reasoning is if a test charge is at the center of a ring, the force exerted on the, the test charge by, um, by charge on any small segment of the ring will be balanced by the force exerted by, by charge on the uh, diametrically opposed segment of the ring. The net force on the, the, the test charge and hence the electric field at that location must then be zero. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. So free electron and a free proton are placed in an identical electric field. Is the following statement true or false? And the answer is false. It is true that the electron and the proton have equal magnitude charges of opposite signs. The force, forces exerted on these particles by the electric field have equal magnitude in opposite directions. However, the electron experiences an acceleration of greater magnitude than does the proton because the electron's mass is much smaller than that of the proton. Okay, well, let's um, talk about a problem solving strategy. And this is for calculating electric forces and fields. So the first thing, you, as in many cases, you drawing a diagram is a good place to start. So you wanna draw a diagram with the charges in the problem. Two, you wanna identify the charges of interest Q and circle it. Three, you wanna con convert all units to SI with charges in coulombs and distances in meters so as to be consistent with the SI values of the Coulomb's constant um, Ke. 
Four, you want to apply Coulomb's law for each charge Q, find the electric force on the charge of interest Q. The magnitude of the force will be found using Coulomb's law. The vector direction of the electric force is along the line of the two charges directed away from Q if the charges have the same sign, towards Q if the charges have the opposite fine, sign. Find the angle theta that this vector makes with the positive x-axis. The x component of the electric forces exerted by Q on F will be F cosine theta, and the y component will be F sine theta. Number five, sum of all um, x components. Get the x components of the resultant electric forces. Six, sum up all the y components. Get the y components of the resultant electric force. And finally, use the Pythagorean theorem and trigonometry to find the magnitude and direction of the resultant force if desired. Okay, let's talk about electric field lines. And so in the figure, we're showing the electric field lines for a point charge. Um, you, you can note that the figures show only those field lines that lie in the plane of the page. To help visualize the electric field, we can draw lines pointing in the direction of the, the electric field vectors at any point. These lines, which were introduced by Michael Faraday, are called the electric field lines, and they are related to the electric field in any region of space in two ways. Number one, the electric vector, electric field vector E is tangent to the electric um, field lines at each point. And number two, the number of lines per unit area through a um, surface perpendicular to the lines are proportional to the strength of the electric field at any given region. Note that E is large when the field lines are close together and small when the lines are far apart. The figure on the left shows some representative negative field lines for a single positive point charge. Note that this is a two-dimensional dra drawing and so contains only the field lines that lie in the plane containing the point charge. The lines are actually directed radially outward from the charge in all directions. Think of the quills of an angry porcupine. Because a positive test charge placed in the field would be repelled by the, the charge Q, the lines are directed radially away from the positive charge. The electric field lines for a single negative point charge shown in the figure on the right are directed towards a charge because a positive test charge is attracted by a negative charge. In either case, the lines are radial and extend all the way to infinity. Note that the lines are closer together as they get near the charge, indicating that the strength of the field is increasing. So in this figure, we have a, the electric field lines for two equally and oppositely opposite point charges, which forms an electric dipole. So here are rules for, for drawing electric field lines for any charge distribution. For, so number one, the lines for a group of point charges must begin on positive charges and end on negative charges. In this case, in, in the case of excess of charge, some lines will begin or end um, infinitely far away. The number of lines drawn leaves, leaving a positive char char charge or ending on a negative charge is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. Number three, no two field lines can cross e each other. The figure shows a, the symmetric electric field lines for two positive charges of equal magnitude but of opposite signs. The charge co um, configuration is called an electric dipole. Note that the number of lines that begins at the positive charge must equal the number that terminate at the negative charge. At points very close to either charge, so the lines are, are nearly radial. The high density of lines between the charges tell us the, that there is a strong electric field in the region. So in this figure, we are showing the electric field lines for two positively charged, um, two positive point charges. So we're looking at the, the electric field lines in the vicinity of two equally positive point charges. Uh, again, close to either charge, the lines are nearly radial. The, the same number of lines emerge from each charge because the charges are of equal magnitude. 
at large distances from the charges, the field is approximately equal to that of a single point charge of magnitude 2 Q. So in this figure, we're looking at the electric field lines for a point charge of 2 Q and a second point charge of minus Q. So this is a sketch of the electric field lines associated with a positive charge plus 2Q and the negative charge minus Q. In this case, the number of lines leaving charge plus 2Q is twice the number of terminating charge minus Q. So that means that only half of the lines that leave the positive charge end at the negative charge. The remaining half terminate on, on negative charges that we assume to be located at infinity. So they're just going off, um, not being shown that they're connecting to anything. At great distances from the charge, which means great compared with the, the, the charge separation, the electric field lines are equivalent to those of a single charge of plus Q. So let's look at this question, rank the, the magnitude of the electric fields at point A, B, and C in the figure below, largest magnitude first. And the, the order would be A, B, and then C. The, the field is greatest at point A because this is where the field lines are closest together. The, the absence of lines at point C indicate that the, the electric fields there is zero. So those are some things that to keep in consideration. Well, let, let's talk about conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. So in the figure that the situation is impossible if the conductor is in electrostatic equilibrium. If the electric field E has component parallel to the surface and an electric force would be exerted on the charges along the surface and they would move to the left. When no net motion or of, of charge occurs within a conductor, we say that the conductor is in electrostatic equilibrium. An isolated conductor has four different properties. Number one, the electric field is, is zero, where everywhere inside the conducting material, we can use property one by, we can understand property one by thinking about what would happen if, if this were not true. If there were an electric field inside a conductor, the, the free charge there would move and flow, and a flow of charge or current would be created. If there were a net movement of charge, the conductor would no longer be in electrostatic equilibrium. For number two, any excess charge on an isolated conductor resides entirely on its surface. So property number two is in direct result of the one over R squared repulsion between the charges described in Coulomb's law. If by some means an excess of charge is placed inside a conductor, the repulsive forces between the, the like charges push them as far apart as possible, causing them to quickly migrate to the surface. Number three, the electric fields just outside a charge conductor is perpendicular to the conductor surface. So we can understand property three by again considering what would happen if, if there were, if it were not true. If the electric field in the figure isn't perpendicular to the surface, it would have a component along the surface, which would cause the free electrons of the conductor to move to the left in the figure. If the charges moves, a, a current is created and the conductor is not in electrostatic equilibrium. That means that E must be perpendicular to the surface. So um, now in this figure, we have a, a conductor with a flattened end A and a relatively sharp end B. The excess charge placed on the conductor resides entirely at the surface and is distributed so that um, B, there is less charge per unit area on the flattened end, and C, there is a large um, charge per unit area on the sharpened end. So number four, on, uh, on an irregularly charged conductor, the charge accumulates at sharp points where the, the radius of the curvature of the surface is smallest. So to see property number four um, must be true. Consider the figure on the left, which shows a conductor that is fairly flat at one end and relatively pointed at the other. Any XX charge placed on the object moves to its surface. Um, so we see in the figure that the forces between the two charges at the flattened end of the object, the, 
these forces are predominantly directed par um, parallel to the surface so the charges move apart until repulsive forces from other nearby charges estab establish an equilibrium. At the sharp end, the forces of repulsion between the two charges are directed predominantly away from the surface as the figure, as we're seeing in the figure. Um, as a result, there is less tendency for the, the charges to move apart along the surface here and the, the amount of charge per unit area is greater than at the, the flat end. The, the cumulative effect of the, the sharp end producing a large resultant force directed away from the surface that can that can be large enough to cause charges to leap from the surface into the surrounding air. So here's a um, picture of an experiment showing that any charge transfer to a con conductor resides at the surface in electrostatic equilibrium. The hollow conductor is insulated from ground and the small metal ball is supported by an insulating thread. So we know from experiments that the net charge on the conductor resides on the surface. One such experiment was first performed by Michael Faraday and is referred to Faraday's ice pail experiment. Faraday lowered a negatively charged metal ball at the end of a silk th thread, and, which was an insulator into an uncharged hollow conductor insulated from the ground. A metal ice pail, as in the top left figure, as a ball entered the pail, the needle on the electrometer attached to the outer surface of the pail observed um, to deflect. An electrometer is a device used to measure charges. The needle deflected because a charged ball induced a positive charge on the inner wall of the, the pail, which left an unequal negative charge on the outer wall, as you can see at the top of the figure. Faraday next touched the, the inner surface of the pail with the ball and noted that the deflection of the needle did not change either when the ball touched the inner surface of the pail as in the bottom left figure or when it was removed as in the, in the bottom, bottom right figure. He also found that the ball was now uncharged because when it touched the inside of the pail, the excess negative charge in the ball had been drawn off neutralizing the induced positive charge on the inner surface of the pail. In this way, Faraday discovered that the useful result that all the excess charge in an object can be transferred to an already charged metal shield if the object is touched to the inside of the shell. The result is the principle of the operation of the Van de Graaff generator. Faraday concluded that because the, the deflection of the needle in the electrometer didn't change when the charge ball touched the inside of the pail, the positive charge induced on the inside surface of the pail was just enough to, to neutralize a negative charge on the ball. As a result of his investigation, he concluded that the charged object suspended inside a metal container rearranged the charge on the, con the cont container so that the sign of the charge on its inside surface was opposite the sign of the charge on the suspended object. This produced a charge on the outside surface of the container, the same sign as that of the suspended object. Faraday also found that if the electrometer was connected to the inside surface of the pail after the experiment had been run, the needle showed no deflection. This means the excess charge acquired by the pail when, it, when, um, in con when contact was made between the ball and the pail appeared on the surface of the outer surface of the pail. So here we see a picture of a lightning rod and a metal rod having a sharp point is attached to a house or other building. Most of the charge in the house passes through these points, which eliminates the induced charge on the house produced by storm clouds. Also a lightning discharge strike striking the house passes through the metal rod and is safely carried to the ground through wires leading from the rod to the earth. Benjamin Franklin first developed these lightning rods. Some European countries couldn't accept the fact that such a worthwhile idea could have originated in the new world, so they improved the design by eliminating the sharp points. Here we're seeing a figure of a schematic view of a Millikan oil drop apparatus from 
1909 to 1913, Robert Andrews Millikan performed a brilliant set of experiments at the University of Chicago where he measured the elementary charge E of the uh, electron and demonstrated the quanti quantized nature of the electronic charge. The figure on the left shows his apparatus. Oil droplets that have been charged by friction in an atomizer are allowed to pass through a small hole in the upper plate. A horizontal light beam is used to illuminate the droplets, which are viewed by a telescope with axis at right angles to the beam. The droplets then appear as shining stars against a black background, and the rate of fall of individual droplets can be determined. We will assume a single drop having a mass of M and carrying a charge of Q being viewed and its charge is, is negative. If no electric field is present between the, the, the plates, the two forces acting on the charges are, are the, the force of gravity Mg acting downward and an upward vis, viscous drag force D as shown in the top right figure. The drag force is proportional to the speed of the drop where the drop reaches its terminal speed V, the, the two force, um, forces balance each other, mg equals d. So here we're seeing a, a illustration of a Van de Graaff generator. And so we have a schematic diagram of the Van de, Van de Graaff generator on the left. Um, charge is transferred to the dome by means of a rotating belt. And on the right, we're seeing the, a picture of that in action. Um, in, 1929, Robert Van de Graaff, who lived from 1901 to 1967, designed and built an electrostatic generator that used ex exclusively was used exclusively in nuclear physics research. The figure on the left shows the, the basic construction of the device. A motor-driven pulley P moves the belt past positively um, charged comb-like metallic needles positioned at A. Negative charges are attracted to these needles from the belt, leaving the left side of the belt with a, a net positive charge. The positive charges attract electrons into the belt as it moves past the second comb of needles at B, increasing the excess positive charges on the dome. Because the electric field inside the, the metal dome is neg negligible, the positive charge on it can easily be increased regardless of how much charge is already present. The result is that the dome is left with a large amount of positive charge. This accumulation of charge on the dome can't continue indefinitely. As more and more charge appears on the surface of the dome, the magnitude of the electric field at that surface also increases. Finally, the strength of the field becomes great enough to um, partially ionize the air near the surface, increasing the conductivity of the air. Charges on the dome now have a pathway to leak off into the air, producing some spectacular lightning bolts at the, as, as the discharge occurs, as you can see in the photo on the right. So in this figure, as we look at electron flux, flux and Gauss's law, the field lines of a uniform electric field penetrate a plate of area A perpendicular to the field. The electric flux on phi E through the area is equal to E A. Gauss's law is a technique for calculating the average electric field on a closed surface. It was determined by um, Carl Frederick Gauss, who lived from 1777 to 1855. Gauss's law relates the electric flux through a closed surface and uh, the total charge inside the surface. A closed surface has an inside and outside. An example is a sphere. Electric flux is a measure of how much the electric field vectors penetrate through a given surface. So let's consider an electric field that is uniform in both magnitude and direction, as in the figure. The electric field lines penetrate a, a surface of area A, which is perpendicular to the field. The technique used for drawing a figure like this is that the number of lines per unit area N over A is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field, which we can rewrite as N is proportional to EA, which means that the number of field lines is proportional to the product of E and A called the electric flux represented, represented by phi. So the electric flux is proportional to the number of field lines that pass through some area A 
oriented perpendicular to the field. We call it flux by analogy with the term flux in um, fluid flow, which is a volume of a liquid flowing through a perpendicular area per second. So here we are showing field lines for a uniform electric field through an area A that is an angle of 90 degrees minus phi to the field. If the surface is not perpendicular to the field, as in this figure, the ex expression for the electric flux is shown here, where a vector perpendicular to the area A is at angle theta with respect to the field. You refer to this vector as a normal vector to the surface. The number of lines that cross this area is equal to the number that cross the, the pro projected area A. Um, which is perpendicular, I'm sorry, A prime, which is perpendicular to the field, you can see that the two areas are related by A prime equals A cosine theta. From our flux equation, we can see that the flux through a surface of fixed area has the maximum value EA when the surface is perpendicular to the field, that is when theta equals zero degrees and that the flux is zero when the surface is parallel to the field when theta equals 90 degrees. By conventions for a closed surface, the flux lines passing into the interior of the volume are negative and those passing out of the interior of the volume are positive. This convention is the same as requiring the, the normal vector of the surface to point outward when computing the flux through a closed surface. Okay, let's consider a couple of questions. So first, um, calculate the magnitude of the flux of a constant electric field of five newtons per coulomb in the Z direction through a rectangle with area of four meters squared in the X, Y plane. And the answer is 20 newton meters squared per coulomb. So that was um, item number three. And the reasoning is that when a plane area is a is in uniform is in a, in a uniform electric field E. The flux through the area is phi equals E cosine E A cosine theta, where theta is the angle of the electric field um, makes with a line normal to the plane of A. If A lies in the x y plane and E is in the z direction, then theta equals zero, and so therefore E equals E theta, and we can calculate that out and come up with the answer twenty. So calculate the magnitude of flux of a constant electric field of five newtons per coulomb tilted 60 degrees from the positive z, direxis, P, z direction through a rectangular with area four meters squared in the xy plane. And the answer is 10 meters per second. So it's we get the same equation and everything, but because then we just have to be using um, theta equals 60 degrees. And so as a result, um, that changes the, the value, and that's why we get 10 rather than 20. Okay, let's talk about Gauss's law. Um, in the picture, we're, we're seeing the, the flux through a spherical surface at radius r surrounded at, uh, surrounding a point char charge Q, um, where phi E is um, Q over epsilon zero. So let's consider a point charge Q surrounded by a spherical surface of radius R centered on the charge, as in the figure. The magnitude of the electric field everywhere on the surface of the surface is given in the equation shown. Note that the electric field is perpendicular to this spherical surface at all points on the surface. The electric flux through the surface is simply EA, where A is a surface area of the sphere. It's sometimes convenient to express Ke in terms of another constant. The constant epsilon zero is called the permit, permittivity of free space and has the value shown. The, the use of Ke or epsilon zero is strictly a matter of taste. And so you can choose which one you might want to consider. So here, um, we're having a figure of the flux through an arbitrary surface surrounding the charges is also equal to Q over epsilon zero. We can now express the uh, electric 
flux through the closed spherical surface that surrounds the, the charge Q as shown. The result says that the electric flux through a, a sphere that surrounds a, a charge Q is equal to the charge divided by a constant epsilon zero. This result is true for any closed surface that surrounds the charge Q. For example, if the surface surrounding Q is irregular as in the figure, the flux through the surface is also Q over epsilon zero. This leads to the following general result known as Gauss's law. The electric flux through any closed surface is equal to the net charge inside the surface divided by epsilon zero. So Gauss's law describes how charge, charges cr create electric fields. In principle, it can always be used to calculate the electric field of, of a system of charges or a continuous distribution of charge. In practice, the, the technique is useful only in cases with a high degree of symmetry, for example, spheres, cylinders, or planes. With the, the symmetry of these special shapes, the, the charges can be surrounded by an imaginary surface called a Gaussian surface. This imaginary surface is used strictly for mathematical calculation, is not an actual physical surface. Even though Gauss's law in this form can be used to obtain the electric field only for problems with a lot of symmetry, it can always be used to obtain the average electric field on any surface. Okay, um, let's consider this question. Find the electric field through the surface in the figure below. And the answer is minus six coulombs um, over epsilon zero. And the reason being is that Gauss's law states that the electric flux through any closed surface is equal to the net enclosed charge divided by the permiss permittivity of free space. For the for surface shown in the figure, the net enclosed charge is Q equals to minus six coulombs, which gives phi e, um, e is um, Q over epsilon zero. And so um, that's how we, we get that Q is, is, is minus six. And so we get that answer. Um, here is a, another question. So for a closed surface through which the, the net flux is zero, each of the following four statements could be true. Which of the statement must be true? And the answer is B and D. And so since the net flux through the surface is zero, Gauss's law states that the net charge enclosed by the surface must be zero as stated in B. Statement D must be true because there would be a net flux through the surface if more lines entered the surface than left it or vice versa. Okay, here um, we're looking at Gauss's law some more. And so in the figure, we have a cross section of an idealized parallel plate capacitor electric field vector contributions sum together in between the place, but cannot outside. So an important circuit element that we will study in um, the next topic in, in, is the parallel plated capacitor. So we're talking about a capacitor, if you've ever heard of that. The device consists of a plate of positive charge with a negative plate placed above it. The sum of these two fields is illustrated in the figure. The result is an electric field with double the magnitude in between the two plates. Outside the, the plates, the electric field cancels. Okay, um, we have a, a bunch of questions here. And so I'm just gonna quickly go through those and give the answer um, and then finish with the, the summary. So the, the diagram below shows two uniformly charged spheres that the charge on the, the right sphere is three times as large as the charge on the left sphere, which force diagram best represents the magnitude and direction of the electric force on the two spheres? And the answer is number four. So in this one, um, we have a similar type of a question. Um, which choice best represents the magnitude and direction of the electric field vectors created by one sphere as at the location of the two spheres? And the answer is number five. So all charge rods have the same length and the same linear charge density, plus or minus. Light rods are positive, positively charged and dark rods are negatively charged. For which arrangement, arrangement below would the magnitude of the electric charge at the origin be the largest? And the answer is number six. 
Um, two uniformly charged rods are, are positioned horizontally as shown. The top rod is positively charged and the bottom rod is negatively charged. The total electric field at the origin and the answer is points totally in the minus y direction is the answer. Where other than at infinity is the electric field zero in, in the, the vicinity of the dipole shown? And the answer is none of the above. And finally, the, the circles in the figure below are Gaussian surfaces. All other lines are electric fields. For which case is the, is the flux non-zero? And the answer is A, B, and F. Um, so we construct a closed Gaussian surface in the shape of a spherical balloon. Assume that a small glass bead with total charge Q is in the vicinity of the balloon. Consider the following statements and um, which statements are true. And the answer is both A and B are valid. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and finish up with um, a couple summary charts here. For electric charges, insulators, and conductors, electric charges have the following properties. Unlike charges uh, attract one another and, and, un, and like charges repel one another, number two. Electric charge is always conserved, number three. Charge comes in discrete packets that are interval multiples of the basic electric charge E equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus nine coulombs. Number four, the force between two charged particles is proportional to the inverse square of the distance between them. Conductors are made in our, our materials in, in which charges move freely in response to an electric charge. All other materials are called insulators. For Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law states that the electric force between two stationary charge particles separated at distance r has a magnitude given by the equation where Ke is the Coulomb constant. For electric fields, an electric field E exists at some point in space if a small test charge Q0 placed at that point is acted upon by an electric field force F. The electric field is defined as shown. The magnitude of the electric field due to a point charge at Q at a distance R from the point charge is given here. The direction of the electric field at a point in space is defined to be the direction of the electric force that would be exerted on a small positive char charge placed at that point. For electric field lines, electric field lines are useful for visualizing the electric field in any region of space. The electric field vector E is tangent to the electric field lines at, at every point. Further, the number of electric field lines per unit area through a surface perpendicular to the lines is proportional to the strength of the electric field um, at the, that surface. For conductors in electrostatic equilibrium, a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium has the following properties. Number one, the electric field is zero everywhere inside the conducting material. Any excess charge on an isolated conductor must reside entirely on the surface. Number three, the electric field just outside a charged conductor is perpendicular to the conductor's surface. And number four, on any ir irregularly shaped conductor, charged, charge accumulates where the radius of the curvature of the surface is smallest at a sharp point. For electric flux and Gauss's law, Gauss's law states that the electric flux through any closed surface is equal to the net charge Q inside the surface divided by the permittivity of free space, epsilon zero. For highly symmetric distributions of charge, Gauss's law can be used to calculate electric fields. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's gonna end this lecture.